So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today, and I want to start out by, uh, by saying that my family is here, my uh, wife Carissa and our three kids, uh, so I'm not going to be cussing, and I ask that, um, that you not either. Uh, um, secondly, um, I know that we have Governor Edwards here in the audience today. I understand that he's announcing that he's not running for governor, and I, um, I, I appreciate that. <laughs> And I guess at some point I ought to clarify that I'm talking about Edward Edwards. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then, um, uh, speaking of the governor's race, uh, the gubernatorial race, I, I actually do have a, an announcement there. Um, I, uh, I am the uh, only Republican uh, that was not included in Senator Kennedy's poll. No, thank you. <laughs> uh, with all seriousness, I, I, I would like to start out by talking about Councilman Buddy Amoroso, uh, who I know all of you know uh, passed away this weekend in an awful, awful tragedy. Uh, Buddy was a friend and um, awful, and we're, we're certainly praying for Denise, his wife, uh, for Thomas, who is still in the hospital with very serious injuries. Buddy was really an impressive figure. Um, I had an opportunity to spend a good bit of time with him working on, on local issues of mutual concern. And of course, the death uh, is, a, is a tragic loss, but I also, I also want to talk a little bit about the silver lining. The silver lining is the fact that look right now at the quotes that you're seeing, and Elizabeth, I think you uh, did a compilation of those. Uh, look at the outpouring of support. You are seeing folks like Woody Jenkins uh, posting quotes and saying that he's a close friend and an ally and that he will be missed. And you're having folks on the left, like uh, Dawn Collins from the school board, uh, talk about how she's praying for um, Councilman's family, for Buddy's family, and how it is a great loss. You know, Buddy was one of those people, one of those rare people that looked all around, regardless of ideology or political affiliation or any types of differences. He looked around for those people that shared mutual goals or those that were focused on solutions. And I think it's an important lesson uh, for all of us to be thoughtful of right now. Um, Buddy gave a lot to our community. And I hope that his legacy is what we're seeing right now. His legacy is largely the fact that we can work with other people that may be different. We can work with other people that may share ideological differences. Um, because we have bonds, we have things that bring us together that are much stronger than those things that divide us. And I think Buddy was a, was a great witness of that, uh, a great example of that. And uh, I just want to circle back and urge all of you to please keep his family in your, in your prayers and Thomas in his prayers as he works toward recovery. Um, so right now in this, in this era of divisiveness, what can Buddy teach us? We have started this job in Congress by actually trying to work together across political parties. And I think that we didn't do that just for the purpose of being able to have a talking point to say that we have Republicans and Democrats that we've worked with. We did it because we think it's the right thing to do. And I think when you look at our legislative successes, uh, the evidence is there. Working very closely with uh, our Congressman Cedric Richmond, on many flood recovery issues. And I'll tell you, Cedric and I have band together on many other issues, including in the aftermath of the police shootings, trying to bring peace together to our community, trying to bring our community back together and not allow our community to be divided. We, um, we have gained co-sponsorships on virtually every bill that we've introduced. We've worked together in a bipartisan manner on amendments, not again because of a talking point, but because we think it's the right thing to do to find that common ground and I think when you look at our legislative successes, you see evidence of that. Things like um, being able to work together with the governor on uh, some traffic problems, being able to work with them on flood recovery issues and on flood protection issues. And just back in April, where we sent a joint press release on a $1.2 billion announcement in federal funds that we were able to secure uh, for flood mitigation and flood protection, one of the largest investments in Louisiana history. Working together on uh, flood recovery, whereby 
Uh, we had a meeting with Secretary Ben Carson just recently, and they were in session, and so Mark Cooper, the Chief of Staff, came with us uh, to, to join that meeting so we could be sharing both perspectives, because it wasn't an opportunity to sit there and point fingers. It was an opportunity for us to truly have the Secretary's ear to have all the players in the room to figure out why Restore program was going so slowly and why recovery was going slowly and, and helping to address solutions and came out with some good outcomes as a result of that meeting. The legislation we introduced, uh, just learning from the, the awful situation uh, in the aftermath of the flood, whereby flood victims weren't able to get a status of their claims uh, from FEMA. That you couldn't even, you'd call an 800 number, couldn't get anyone to answer. Um, and people couldn't even figure out what the status of their claims was. Am I going to be able to get back in my home? Am I going to be able to eat my next meal? And we passed a law that the president signed that requires that information be put online for an online database so someone can simply use their phone to access the information instead of having to go through and, and connect with someone on the phone. Um, legislation right now that we're working on with Congressman Joe Kennedy of Massachusetts, uh, legislation we introduced that updates the Privacy Act in 1974, once again, to recognize the fact that we have these, which in 1974 didn't exist, and that we can simply comply, comply with the Privacy Act electronically, just like you can file your taxes, and not have to wait literally weeks to get assistance from federal agencies or from your own congressional office, because they, that you have to file paper files. It's ridiculous. And so, again, working and showing incredible progress by working in a bipartisan basis. And we've had a lot of other wins that I think are very important. Number one, and one that um, I think we talked about at Press Club in our very first speech here, and that was the fact that Washington Street exit is completely ridiculous. The fact that it's the only place in the United States where we're, the interstate system funnels down to one lane, and today, as a result of federal dollars and action that we were able to carry out, there are cranes working on that right now, and with 12 months, you will see an entire reconfiguration that is a win-win solution because one, it still preserves the opportunity for people to access that area from an exit lane off the interstate. And number two, it eliminates the place where the traffic funnels down and is a, an, important, an important hurdle that we've eliminated to work toward our long-term success, which of course is uh, getting additional lane on I-10, which we're seeing right now under construction once again as a result of federal funds and our long-term goal of getting a new bridge crossing the Mississippi River, which I'll tell you, I employed our secret weapons, our, um, our eight and 10 year old last week in a meeting with Secretary Lane Chow, Secretary of Transportation, where um, I was sitting there looking at her, trying to figure out how I was gonna break through and convince her that we needed more federal involvement in our, in our bridge solution here. And uh, so uh, the, the girls actually tag teamed her and did a phenomenal job and she couldn't say no. Uh, it, was a, it was a great, we posted the video up, they did a fantastic job. Um, but once again, working toward the traffic solutions, including $500 million increase in federal funds uh, through a negotiation and a highway bill, including over $100 million in grants for transportation projects in South Louisiana. Um, so making progress, but we certainly have a long way to go, and we're going to continue focusing on a bridge. But I do want to highlight once again, Washington Street exit is being eliminated and entirely reconfigured. And we are turning dirt right now and adding lanes to I-10 from Highland to 73, in addition to in the Baton Rouge region, and including on the west side of the river. But not just that. Um, we've been able to uh, work the last time I was here. I talked about cats and my frustration with the regional bus service. And been working with Bill DeVilliers, and I want to be clear, we're not at the goal line, but progress has been made. Eliminating inefficient routes, Reducing the size of buses whenever the, 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 the capacity is not being anywhere close to being challenged or met. And we've been able to bring millions of dollars in additional funds to CATS in order to help them improve the efficiency of their services, which let's remember, that's good for the people who use it, and it's good for the people who pay for it, efficiency and service. We're continuing to work with them because we still have a long way to go. We've been able to get funds to come in and point QP Parish to relocate some of the repetitive flood loss areas in Pecan Acres, working on the same thing right now in Silverleaf Community in Gonzales, and also uh, through the same USDA program, $50 million in funds for Livingston Parish in order for them to uh, carry out flood improvements. $300 million in, in funds through FEMA, uh, through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, all federal funds, helping to improve flood protection and resiliency in the, uh, largely in the areas that were flooded in 2016. Uh, we've been able to get Red Snapper, something that the federal government reduced our fishing days down to just three days. That's something that Louisiana being sportsman's paradise, certainly access to fisheries and being able to only fish for three days. When I was a kid, we could do it year round. Something that it's been unbelievable the demand from the broad spectrum of people across 
uh, South Louisiana that have been pushing us on this. And last year and this year, the state is managing that program where we've been able to fish for over 40 days, having access to this fisheries that's so important to our, our livelihood, our culture in South Louisiana. Um, we've been able to pass legislation through the House of Representatives, which updates our SNAP or our food stamp program. And let me be clear because this is something that has been misconstrued. You can look back between 2000 and 2015, you've seen the program triple and quadruple in terms of the number of people that have been dependent on these programs and the cost to taxpayers. That program is not working for those that are dependent upon it, and it is not working for those that are paying for it. Therefore, through the House Farm Bill, we have been able to pass legislation that largely models legislation that we'd introduced with over 100 co-sponsors that simply connects the dots between those that are on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program and the job training and job assistance programs that are out there. Right now in America today, we have 6.6 .6 million jobs available, the highest number ever. We have the ability to use these existing federally funded programs to connect people with the job skills they need to get back into the workforce. The best thing you can do for someone's health, the best thing you can do for someone's prosperity, the best thing you can do for someone's self-confidence. Study after study show this. Pilot programs in Maine, in Kansas, and in Alabama showed extraordinary success, and I remind you, this should not be a partisan issue, as our own governor, Governor John Bell Edwards, has also supported work requirements associated with different types of poverty programs. This should not be a divisive issue. This is in the best interest of those paying for it and in the best interest of those that are stuck in the cycle of poverty. We have got to make sure we connect the dots between these existing programs, and I'm excited about that being included in the Farm Bill and the, the work that we had done to, to, to lay that out. Um, online bids for offshore energy lease sales, other legislation we passed that is now being employed today. Um, uh, we, um, importantly, were able to make fundamental reforms to the Corps of Engineers through House passed legislation. And I want to talk about this one a little bit. We now chair the Water Resources Subcommittee, which I'll tell you, getting that gavel in a second term was, was pretty amazing. That was a long shot, and we were able to, to win that one. And what it did is it put us in the room for drafting these bills. The Corps of Engineers has been one of the greatest frustrations in my life. Having an agency that can go out there and study projects for decades, can spend tens of millions of dollars without ever putting a shovel in the ground. Those are our dollars. Again, it's not fair to people that are paying for it, and it's not fair to those people that are dependent upon the success or the delivery of these projects. So what have we done? Number one, in that legislation, we improved the ability of parishes, levy board, the state of Louisiana, the CPRA here, to take the lead on these projects whenever they can deliver them faster and cheaper, whenever they can deliver something that's more responsive to the public demands. Instead of stepping in and doing a five-year, excuse me, a, uh, a spot dredging where the Corps of Engineers may pay a company a million dollars to send a dredge from the East Coast to here to come dredge, we have them give them the authority to do a five-year dredging contract where they can group channels like the Atchafalaya River, the Mississippi River, uh, Bayou Lafourche, and, and Home and Navigation Canal, all in a five-year contract, keeping a dredge here, working permanently, turning dirt and, and, and restoring the coast instead of spending money on mobilization and demobilization costs. And by the way, ensuring the depths of these canals to where we can maintain the top five ports in the nation. And importantly, perhaps the thing that I'm most excited about, is that we've included provision in there that begins the process to move the Corps of Engineers out of the Department of Defense. The Department of Defense. So here we have Secretary of Defense Mattis out there focused on Russia, China, North Korea, Iran, and wetlands permits. It reminds me of the Sesame Street, which one's different? It has absolutely no compatibility. No compatibility with the agency mission and no compatibility with the priorities of the Secretary. That is what, in my opinion, has allowed this agency to become both slow and expensive. And we have the opportunity to fix that. And just two weeks ago, the president released an innovation initiative that included moving the Corps of Engineers partially to the Department of Transportation and partially to the Department of Interior. I'm not saying we fully support his vision, but moving it out and getting support from the administration is certainly very helpful. There were a lot of other wins for Louisiana in that bill, but let me tell you what I think is most important. That legislation, which makes fundamental changes in water resources, it passed the House by 408 to 2. In this uber-partisan environment where folks are fighting over absolutely anything and everything they can find, we were able to pull together 408 votes to 2 against. And I tried really hard to get those last two. And um, 
One of them told me that uh, he, he told me the bill was unconstitutional. I said, "Well, look, just vote for it. We'll change the constitution." But it didn't. Uh, <laughs> it didn't. It didn't work out. Um, but um, but look, I just want to reiterate: things are happening, and it's been extraordinary seeing the progress on flood recovery, the changes in reform in the Corps of Engineers, the disaster reform bill we passed through the House of Representatives by a vote of 393 to 15, making fundamental changes and applying common sense to disaster reform, to water resource projects, and to infrastructure investments in the state of Louisiana. Things are happening. I also want to talk about, briefly, the status of the nation today. You can look around right now, and I mentioned this just a few minutes ago, we have 6.6 .6 million new jobs in the United States. Most jobs available ever. We have a 17-year low unemployment rate for women. 17 years. That's the right direction. Lowest unemployment rate ever for African Americans and Hispanics. That's the right direction. And being able to help improve the competitiveness of the U.S. economy is not a partisan issue. The, the reality is that in 1986, I had a mullet, and the tax code was, that was the last time the tax code was updated. 1986. We can't operate on a 1986 tax code when other countries in the world are operating off of updated tax codes. These didn't even exist in 86. Think about the fundamental changes in our economy, and other countries recognized it, and that's why they updated their tax code. That's why they have lower tax rates in certain industries and in certain situations, reflecting today's economy in 2018, not 1986, 32 years ago. And so we've updated the tax code, helping to improve the competitiveness of US businesses. And it's been encouraging watching investments come back to the United States, including facilities that relocated years ago coming back. It's been impressive seeing the complementary uh, efforts on deregulation, where the president signed an executive order and saying for every one new regulation, we're going to rescind two, when in practice, 24 have been rescinded. Not to, not to go out there and trash the environment or to go out there and, and threaten the safety or health of our communities, but more so to have more efficient regulatory approaches to simply help improve the efficiency of our economy and complement the tax reform. And the last thing that we're working on right now that I think is the third leg of that stool is innovation. I said this last time I spoke here. Why is it that I can go on Amazon right now and I can order something that can be at my house at my front door tomorrow? Why is it that I can go on ZocDoc and I can make an appointment and have an appointment at a physician tomorrow? And why is it that a, a comparable experience with the federal government is that it may take you years to get a wetlands permit or even a response? And that the VA is taking an average of 16 days just to call people back to schedule an appointment. It's not okay. And so innovation is a big part of, the, of the, that stool, the third leg of that stool, to complement tax reform, to complement regulatory reform, to ensure that this nation is able to provide the customer service that taxpayers deserve, to where we can have the government we deserve and not the government that we have. Now lastly, I want to talk about the horizon. What are we working on in the future? Some of the big things that we're going to be working on for the rest of this year include immigration reform. And as many of you may know, uh, two bills that, that tried to pass the House in the last few weeks failed. That doesn't mean that immigration policy or the situation we have today is okay. It means that we have more work to do and we're likely to work on some more rifle shot bills instead of trying to do a comprehensive reform measure. We're going to be working on national flood insurance program that currently expires in July because we need to ensure in an area like South Louisiana that when folks purchase a house or own a home or a business that they have access to flood insurance. And um, the, the Senate recently extended it six months, which I fully support. Uh, but, but at the end of the day on flood insurance, flood insurance by itself being managed in a vacuum is a failed approach. It's like going out in the field and just having a defense uh, in a football game and not having an offense as well. You have to integrate the efforts of the Corps of Engineers and other agencies that are leaning forward on the offense and being proactive in your protection and restoration. You have to, you can't just rely upon a strong defense. These things go hand in hand. And so we're working on that with flood insurance. We're working on legislation this month to help expand, to help increase the amount of revenues that the state of Louisiana receives from offshore energy revenues. We're working on that in the committee and I expect that bill to be moving by the end of the month. We're continuing to push the disaster reform bill, which includes something called duplication of benefits, 
whereby someone who might have received a loan from the Small Business Administration in the aftermath of the 2016 flood is now being told that they're not eligible for a grant because a loan and a grant are duplicative of one, one another. I don't subscribe to that. And so actually we've worked with, with uh, Congressman Cedric Richmond, uh, with um, uh, Governor Edwards, and with many, many Republicans from Texas, Florida, um, and uh, Puerto Rico, in addition to bipartisan support from, uh, from other states and, and from uh, Virgin Islands. Um, so we're continuing to work on that to make sure that, uh, that that issue is addressed. Continuing to work on other infrastructure like roads and bridges because it's an important part of the overall solutions in this region where, Louis, where Baton Rouge was just designated the 13th worst traffic in the nation. It's not acceptable. Our population is not anywhere near, not anywhere near that in terms of the top populations in the nation. Our traffic far, far uh, exceeds the, the, the population density in anything that should be reasonable in this area. It is threatening our economy. It's threatening the, the, the health of our citizens when they can't even get to the doctor or hospital. Um, it's going to be very hard to grow the, the, the jobs in this region with that. And of course, the tailpipe emissions, the extra gasoline, and the wasted time sitting in traffic. So we're working on additional uh, legislation related to transportation infrastructure as well uh, later this year. So, um, I just want to close and say this. I know that, that politics is, a, is divisive, and especially right now. Uh, it's the worst that I've ever seen in the, in the time uh, that I've been involved, and, and certainly when I was working on coastal issues for the state, uh, we, we worked very hard to make sure we had bipartisan support. I don't think we ever had votes against the, the legislation and other things we were working on. We got the support of the environmental community and the oil and gas community by sitting down and working together and working with people. And we're trying to employ those same strategies here. But I think everyone in this room plays a role in that. I think that every single one of you, whether you're writing stories, you're posting on social media, you're responding verbally to people, it's really easy sometimes to just give that quick emotional response. But I, I think that every single one of us has the uh, responsibility to take a deep breath, to think very carefully, to think about how Buddy would respond to make sure that we're not adding to that divisiveness, but rather deflating it or taking away from it. While there are many problems in this nation, we can sit here and cite them, whether it's health care and drug costs, whether it's uh, energy problems and, and high energy prices, uh, mental health, opioid abuse, and many, many other challenges we can sit here and talk about forever. One of the greatest threats to this nation today and to our, our government, I think, is the divisiveness. Because if we can't respond to the needs, if we can't provide the solutions that are needed in our community, in our nation, then that divisiveness is just going to grow. And so I want to urge you, think about what Buddy did. Think about how he acted, how he worked with people, how he had the ride for peace just weeks before his death. I think there's much to be learned there. So thank you very much and happy to take any questions that you may have. Well, some of them. <laughs> yes. All right, so uh, just getting to your um, support for this plan of moving the Corps of Engineers into other departments, be it transportation or the interior. Uh, I guess as we get to the local matters here, obviously there's so much at stake. There's so many projects here locally that the Corps of Engineers would be overseeing. Um, just what, what would such a move, such a shift mean for keeping these projects going? Well, um, in, across the nation right now, there's approximately, um, I'm sorry, uh, you, asked, uh, you asked about uh, the Corps of Engineers and what that reform would mean locally if we were able to reorganize the Corps, put them in a different agency. Uh, what would be the impact here? And, and so let me go back to my personal experiences when I was working for the state on, on hurricane protection and coastal projects. We routinely were able to deliver projects for one half to one third the cost of the Corps of Engineers. Think about that, one third to one half the cost. If we're able to employ those successes across the nation, that's building two to three times as many projects as we're building today. Right now, the Corps of Engineers across the country has a backlog of about $100 billion. Approximately one third of that is in the state of Louisiana. That's, a, that's incredible. So this has a disproportionate impact on us. Some of the things that we've done, and I touched on this earlier, We've been working to circumvent the Corps of Engineers, $300 million through FEMA, $1.2 billion through uh, Department of Housing and Urban Development, giving those funds to the state, trying to circumvent the Corps, their delays and their expense. Um, so what it means, I think, when you, when you look at reorganizing and putting it in a different agency, 
You're going to see a cabinet secretary that truly prioritizes the mission. You're going to see a situation where projects are not allowed to languish or sit back and, uh, and, and drag on for not years, but decades, as we've seen in the state of Louisiana. Um, and I think uh, locally we can talk about projects like right now, and I, and I want to I want to highlight this. Right now, we are working on a program of bringing various funding sources together um, uh, to help advance nearly $1.5 billion in flood protection projects for this region. Uh, this is something we've been working on for about 15 months. Important projects like the Comeet project that we've delivered $37 million on, or I think in excess of 10 times the amount of money that was provided in the previous uh, three-year period. Um, projects like um, uh, the, the East Baton Rouge Parish flood control, helping to improve drainage on the five bayous in, in uh, East Baton Rouge Parish from up in the central area uh, down to um, uh, areas around the country club of, of Louisiana. Um, uh, projects like West Shore in the River Region uh, and, and a couple of others. Uh, so we can't just get money for these projects. We can't deliver projects efficiently through this current system. I think what it means is taking these projects that have been around and backlogged for decades, like the Washington Street exit 40 years, the Comate project 30 years, and finally breaking the log jam and actually delivering them. The state of Louisiana has developed an impressive capacity uh, through the Coastal Protection Restoration Authority to be able to carry out these projects and I think rival the expertise of the Corps. And, and I think that you will see projects delivered people uh, being protected, and more importantly, by being proactive, we save billions of dollars because these communities are protected and resilient, and we're not coming in and picking up the pieces after a flood, spending billions. Yeah. Would you care to weigh in on uh, your thoughts on the proposed handset sales tax yeah. uh, for the local uh, transportation improvements and how that's sure. integrated into sure. uh, the sure. discussion? Um, so you, you asked uh, if I could weigh in on the half cent sales tax uh, locally and, and uh, what I thought about that and you're talking about East Baton Rouge Parish and uh, proposal that's been brought forth by the city. Uh, number one, Robert, um, any, anything to help address traffic solutions I think, is, I think is really important and I do like the fact uh, that we're moving toward more of a local or regional approach. Uh, however, um, I have been working with the five parishes in this area um, since 2015 on working on a regional solution. I do have some concern that by doing a East Baton Rouge Parish only tax that you are going to prevent a larger solution because let's be honest, without a bridge and major investments, um, all you're doing is moving the problem from one place to another. Um, that concerns me. Uh, something else that concerns me is, and I, and I want to be clear, I'm, 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 I don't know the answer to this. I don't know how they built the list. Uh, one thing I learned from, from working on, on a um, tens of billions of dollars infrastructure program is that you have to develop prioritization metrics or criteria that help you identify the best projects that deliver the best return on investment um, to make sure that we're not effectively uh, doing a half cent sales tax to get a quarter cent in benefits. And so, um, so number one, I'd rather see a regional solution. Number two, I think that uh, using prioritization metrics to make sure that you're truly providing a return on investment, and, I, and I've, I've said this a couple times uh, over the past month, and I don't know that I've really refined it in a way that makes any sense to anybody, but, um, but, but, but I feel strongly about this statement. Good projects are already paid for. And what I mean by that is if you choose the right projects, if you choose the projects that truly provide a return on investment, they're already being paid for somehow. And I'll give you an example. Right now, we're spending over $900 a year in this region in extra gasoline payments. Extra. Is there a way for us to take those dollars and divert them to being proactive and actually building traffic solutions instead of having people pay $900 this year, next year $1,000, and the year after that $1,200 whenever traffic just becomes completely gridlocked? Um, or we can, can, can we demonstrate to people, hey, here's what we're doing. We're actually diverting this extra gasoline payment that you're making, and we're diverting it into solutions. And within five years, you will be made whole and then some. But then you have to have the prioritization metrics. You have to read the right criteria to identify those projects that will return uh, th that investment to you. And of course, other things is the extra 47 hours a year in traffic, the environmental implications of pumping tailpipe emissions out, and just the inefficiency in overall economy, the lack of economic development here. So, um, so look, make me king for the day. I'd rather see original solution, and I'd like to see the calculations that demonstrate this isn't just paying money, this is actually an investment that's gonna make me whole in X years. Oh, yeah, thanks. Um, yes? Uh, oh, the uh, uh, Bloomberg News Service recently just did a kind of a long piece 
where they went up and down the, the river talking to ports and, and uh, industrial facilities and so forth about the impact of the tariffs yeah. and, and the, the potential problem that it's causing. I think that it was, uh, you know, steel is up uh, X percent and soybeans are down X percent. Yep. Um, could you address the tariff? Uh, Yes, sure. Um, and so you're, you're talking about the, the impacts of ports uh, along the Mississippi River uh, because of the tariffs that were imposed on steel and, and other products. Um, so, so in responding to that, uh, number one, I think you have to look at where we have unfair trade practices and, and some of them that have been recently cited. Uh, you can look at Canada and the dairy uh, uh, taxes that they put on our dairy products being sent to Canada. Uh, you can look at the taxes that China uh, imposes on our cars being sent over there. Uh, there are just outrageous protective measures that are in place all across the globe. And so, uh, first of all, I don't think it's okay to sit back and allow those to continue. Uh, number two, I have personally been involved and had the opportunity to investigate and meet with folks on some of the predatory trade practices, particularly of China, as it relates to steel and aluminum. Not just undermining our domestic industries, trying to um, uh, corner raw materials for some of these um, uh, products. That undermines not just our economy and our domestic facilities and jobs, it undermines our defense, our, our defense industry. And so, uh, let me be clear, um, I have had the opportunity to meet with Secretary Wilbur Ross of Commerce, the United States Trade Representative, the President, the Vice President, and express concern about tariffs and saying, hey look, I think we need to use a scapula and not a sledgehammer. And the response that I got back, which I'll tell you, they did a good job explaining, is they said, look, in the past when we've gone in and we have done scapula type trade remedies, which uh, I remember crawfish. Um, there was a trade remedy that was imposed on crawfish, where I think tariffs of 210%. China started sending them through Singapore and some other country. And so what they said is they said, look, if we try and take a scapula approach, China's going to find a way around it. We have to go blunt. So here's the thing. Do I like the fact that we're having um, impacts in, to some degree in any sector of our economy, adverse impacts? No. Um, but do I think if we play this right, that we can actually get the trade remedies that provide for freer and fairer trade, that like the return on investment for the transportation projects, can more than offset themselves in a brief period of time, uh, I, I think that would be great and I would fully support that. Now, are you potentially playing with fire? And if you don't play these negotiations right, could you injure the U.S. economy over the long term? Yes, you could. Um, but I think, um, I think that this is consistent with what the President's talked about in terms of unfair trade practices of other countries. I think that now that we've lowered our, our tax rates and now that we have uh, reduced the regulatory burden on domestic workforce, I think that the United States can compete with anyone globally, but we have to be given a level playing field and imposing tariffs and other things that distort the markets, I don't think is in America's best interest because I'll say it again, I think the American workforce can be more innovative, can be more efficient, and can deliver better products around the world if we're given a level playing field. If we could have just one more question, I'm gonna to try to keep the Congressman on his schedule. Oh, uh, uh, look at that, how about, how about two? <laughs> um, Congressman, you um, kind of touched on this $1.5 billion um, in uh, supplemental discussion. Can you, can you speak, in a, in a, give us any more details about that? No. <laughs> um, uh, Elizabeth, you, you asked if I, can, if I can give any more details on, um, on, on $1.5 billion in, um, in, in additional flood dollars. And, and I'll just say that um, this is something we've literally been working on for about 15 months. Um, we, uh, we have had probably two dozen meetings with um, various federal officials, uh, cabinet secretaries, White House officials, and others. Um, uh, we have been working on five different federal funding streams, uh, trying to uh, bring some dollars here because I feel very strongly based on uh, personal professional experiences that if you make principled investments in flood protection and resiliency, that that pays off over and over again. There are studies that say as low as $3 in, in return for every $1 you invest. Uh, there are other studies that say it's up to $8. Uh, I think it's even higher if you use the right criteria to, d to determine where you're making those investments. And I'll just say that stay tuned. We're continuing to work on this. Certainly um, uh, not saying it's a slam dunk, but I'm, I'm saying that we're making a lot of progress. We've been able to overcome some hurdles, and, um, and, and we'll certainly keep you apprised of progress there. All right. All right. Hey, thank you all very much. Appreciate it.